Okay, so in this uh, discussion, I'm going to go over cradle to cradle design and the circular economy. Um, and so, some fundamental questions that we'll answer: What is cradle, cradle, cradle to cradle design? Why is recycling not enough? Um, a lot of folks um, think that recycling is sort of the main way to um, sustainably manage resources and waste, um, and as it turns out, that's actually not the case. Um, and We'll also go over what the circular economy is um, as well. So I want to start off with a little video here from William McDonough, who is one of the creators of the cradle to cradle concept. So I'll play the first few minutes of this. I encourage you to watch the whole thing if you get a chance. Skip to the beginning. In 1962, uh, with Rachel Carson Silent Spring, I think for, for people like me in the world of the making of things, um, the canary in the mine uh, wasn't singing. And so the question that we might not have birds became kind of fundamental to those of us wandering around looking for the meadowlarks that seemed to have all disappeared. And the question was, were the birds singing? Now, I'm not a scientist, that'll be really clear. But, you know, we've just come from this discussion of what a bird might be. What is a bird? Well. In my world, this is a rubber duck. It comes in California with a warning. This product contains chemicals known by the state of California to cause cancer and birth defects or other reproductive harm. This is a bird. <laughs> what kind of culture would produce a product of this kind and then label it and sell it to children? I think we have a design problem. Someone heard uh, six hours of a uh, talk that I gave uh, called the Monticello Dialogues on NPR and sent me this as a thank you note. We realize that design is a signal of intention, but it also has to occur within a world, and we have to understand that world in order to imbue our designs with inherent intelligence. And so as we, as we look back at the basic state of affairs, in which we design. We, in a way, need to go to the primary condition to understand the operating system and the frame conditions of a planet. And I think the exciting part of that is the good news that's there. Because the news is the news of abundance and not the news of limits. And I think as our culture tortures itself now with tyrannies and concerns over limits, have this other dimension of abundance that is coherent, given by the sun, and start to imagine what that would be like to share. It was a nice thing to get. That was one sentence. Uh, Henry James would be proud. This is, uh, I put it down at the bottom, but that was extemporaneous, obviously. The, the fundamental issue is that, for me, design is the first signal of human intention. So what are our intentions? Uh, and what would our intentions be if we wake up in the morning, we have designs on the world? Well, what would our intention be as a species, now that we're the dominant species? And it's not just stewardship and dominion debate, because really, dominion is, uh, uh, is implicit uh, in stewardship, because how could you dominate something you'd killed? Stewardship's implicit in dominion because you can't be a steward of something if you can't dominate it. So the question is, uh, what is the first question for designers? Now, as guardians, let's say the state, for example, which reserves the right to kill, the right to be duplicitous, uh, and so on, uh, the question we're asking the guardian at this point is, are we meant, how are we meant to secure local societies, create world peace, and save the environment? But I don't know that that's the common debate. Um, Commerce, on the other hand, is, is relatively quick, uh, essentially creative, highly effective and efficient, and, uh, and fundamentally honest, because we can't exchange value for very long if we don't trust each other. So we use the tools of commerce primarily for our work, but the question we bring to it is, how do we love all the children of all species for all time? Okay, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, I encourage you to watch the rest of the video. He provides some examples of how they've deployed the cradle to cradle concept into some different products and some even some buildings and so forth. Um, but I think that that question is a really good fundamental question to sort of let you know marinate and um, 
you know, sort of linger as we go through this content, and that is how do we love all children of all species for all time? Um, and also, what is the what is the first question? What is the design question? Um, and I and and that's it's really important, you know, before we move on for you to to think about um, the importance of the intent of the design of products, uh, goods, and so forth, and how that intent Im impacts you know the results so if you think about what are the what's the intent what's the purpose of most of the products that you see it's really to make a profit right now of course there are things you know that are providing a service and there's some, you know, medical technology and there's um, you know food production and all that sort of stuff so it certainly benefits people but the intent of the product really is to s succeed in the market and in, in the marketplace, as we know, we've gone over a few times, the, what drives the market is the, the um, um, you know, looking for profit, right? And so if profit is your design intent, that's really the intent of build, building something or designing something. As, as we've seen, you know, there's all other things that can happen as a result. If like profit's this thing that you're trying to achieve, and you, it's easy to forget all these other impacts of that product, you know, all those externalities, the health externalities, the environmental externalities, and so forth. And so it's really fundamental to all of this, to the cradle, to cradle and the circular economy concepts in particular, that we need to, you know, we need to design them in a totally different way. We need to totally rethink how we design uh, products. So cradle, cradle design, if you think about the term itself, Let's contrast it first with cradle to grave. So cradle to grave, that's that linear resource flow. Okay, we've talked about this before. Extraction, manufacturing, disposal. It's that take, make, waste sort of thing. Where we extract you know, raw materials, we manufacture it, we sell it, we use it, and we just throw it out, right? So cradle to grave, and it's like linear. Um, and it uses mostly non-renewable energy sources, um, and the toxicity of these um, goods are generally not considered. I mean, there's obviously some considerations, but um, with cradle to cradle, we need to rethink that whole process and use renewable energy in these safe, regenerative, closed loop cycles. Okay, so it's circular resource use. It's, you know, instead of that linear flow, it's that circular flow, right? Like we take whatever was the waste and we reuse it and reintegrate it safely into the system. But also they want to... Uh, the goal is to use 100% renewable energy, so that's also something that we can continue um, indefinitely. Um, and so again, they, you know, this is really a systems concept, um, commercially productive, socially beneficial, ecologically intelligent, right? So it's kind of like the three E's. Um, and that they, they mentioned that from an engineering perspective, the problem is too often we just take these products and we design them to do something without any thought for what to do after its useful life uh, is over. And so if we keep designing these products that are not at the, from the outset designed to be recycled, renewed, reintegrated back into the system, then we're left with a bunch of waste. And, we're, and as the, he says in there, we're, um, we sort of have this incremental improvements, like we put all, you know, put everything in plastic, right? With no thought for how you can reuse that plastic or if that plastic can be fully reintegrated back into the system. And so at the end, we have this waste that we need to figure out what to do with. And now we have recycling, which is imperfect. And, you know, a lot of the plastic is thrown out anyway. So if we keep designing things like that and think about cars, right? They're not designed to be pulled apart and, you know, the components uh, used for other vehicles. So we end up with this sort of incremental improvement. Um, but that they don't address these deep design flaws. So the design, as they say, is 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 the uh, flawed. And again, the, we need to rethink how we design from the very beginning. Um, I like this phrase: an efficient pursuit of the wrong goals. Right. So we're um, we we don't have the right goal in mind when we design these products, but we sort of like chip away and make it a little more efficient. Right, and we're, we're addressing the problem that we've created and not the source of the problem. So all of this is very systems thinking based. Okay, and again, I, I, I go back to this fundamental question, how do we love all the children of all species uh, for all time? I mean, that kind of, you know, that's pretty much covers everything, right? Um, and so uh, this is 
uh, a good summary of the cradle to cradle design concept. So I'll play this video and I want you to think about the difference between less bad versus 100% good. What does the cradle to cradle actually refer to and how is this um, systems thinking and why is design important? You may have heard of it, cradle to cradle. Perhaps you're wondering, what is that? Well, here's an explanation. About 160,000 years ago, the first Homo sapiens started to evolve into who we are now, consumers. In 1804, Earth hosted one billion people. Now we are moving towards eight billion with every day more than 200,000 people joining us on this planet. In modern culture, we are surrounded by commercial products, products that make our lives pleasurable and more convenient. So imagine there are 8 billion of us. This means mass production. Being able to produce all these products means we need resources and lots of them. But there's a problem. During all these years, we've kept on using resources, but using without thinking of reusing has led to this potential problem. The time will come that there will be a resource scarcity sooner than most of us realize. And the other problem is waste. Most companies are still working with a take-make-waste industrial system. Carefully designed products are thrown away quicker than before. There's a clear need to react to these problems. Luckily, they are getting more and more attention from both companies and consumers. Two strategies can be indicated. Firstly, the strategy to minimize. Use fewer materials, use less energy because of more energy efficient technologies. And with that, reduce the carbon footprint. But this still only postpones the moment resources will be exhausted and despite reductions, with an increasing world population, volumes keep growing. You could say this current approach is known as reuse, reduce and recycle. And though this is a good start, it is only being less bad. Let me introduce strategy two. Rethink the way we make things and use materials effectively. This is not about being less bad, but about becoming 100% good by improving quality. We can start working from a vision where waste equals food. This is what Michael Brangart and William Madonna have developed and named Cradle to Cradle. So while a good start is to reduce the consumption of materials and stimulate recycling and minimize the amount of energy used in a product life cycle, Cradle to Cradle is about keeping all materials in continuous cycles, stimulating the use of renewable energy only, and celebrating diversity. This requires a different design approach. The design of a product is optimized for its functionality, beauty, and quality to fulfill the need of the customer. But in addition, the design is thought through on how to disassemble it and how the used materials are valuable to nature or as resources for the production of new products. We need to know exactly what materials are being used. Because who wants their child to play with toys that are full of hazardous chemicals? In cradle-to-cradle -cradle design, every part of a product is designed with the intention of bringing it back in the technical cycle or biological cycle. Imagine that we no longer use materials, but we borrow them instead. Then waste would no longer exist. Apart from thinking about materials, cradle-to-cradle -cradle design also considers two other important aspects. Firstly, stimulate the use of renewable energy only. Did you know that every day the sun radiates more energy than the world has used since time began? Using only renewable energy means we can use it endlessly. 
Secondly, celebrate diversity. Look around you. Look at nature as the best example of diversity. Flora and fauna adapt to local situations and make use of local resources. With cradle-to-cradle -cradle design, companies can differentiate with innovative products and make money with 100% good stuff. Designed for its functionality, beauty and quality. Also, they will profit from cost savings and added value. Who benefits? You. Because wouldn't it be great if our children and children's children can enjoy the same quality of life or better because we set good intentions and have redesigned the way we make things. This is what motivates us. Rex. Inspire. Create. Act. Cradle to cradle. Is Okay, so that's a great video. It really describes um, the uh, intent is a register of cradle to cradle design. So cradle to cradle. Again, there's these sort of outlay, you know, uh, outlines these two strategies for resource use. One obviously better than the other. So the first one is use less materials and energy to do the same thing, right? So an efficient pursuit of the wrong goals or less bad, right? So the reduce, reuse, recycle. It's like we make these products and we're like, okay, now we have all this waste. What are we going to do with it now? Okay, let's try to recycle. Maybe we can use, maybe we can upcycle a little bit. But instead of doing that, <clears throat> the, the better approach is to just rethink how we design the materials in the first place. And we should design them to be fully reintegrated back into um, the system, right? So the, the idea that waste should no longer is, exist to the extent possible. <clears throat> um, and so this is a zero waste concept. And, uh, you know, I, I find it interesting that, you know, we kind of have a sense of this biological cycle, you know, if, if we have um, like composting or we know that <clears throat> if we take, you know, an apple core and we throw it out in, in, in the grass, it's going to biodegrade. It's going to go back, you know, go back into the soil. The bugs will eat it and the microbes and all that sort of thing. So those are those biological cycles. Like we have a sense of that. We know that people grow and you eat food and all that sort of thing. Um, but it, what I think is, you know, a kind of innovative about <clears throat> one of the innovative things about cradle to cradle is they um, extend that concept to the technical cycle. So like if we think about all these things around us that are made of organic material, we know that they can be reintegrated back into the environment. Well, we should think of um, products in the same way, like wherever you are sitting right now, like a chair or a table, or I'm looking here, I have like a microwave and so forth, like all of that should be designed so that there's these technical nutrients, the, you know, the things that aren't organic, the metals and, you know, um, rare earth elements and that sort of thing. And that we should design that microwave that I'm looking at to be pulled apart and all of those, um, you know anything it's made of we can consider them technical nutrients and figure out how that we can reintegrate them back into the manufacturing system okay and so there's there's three overall tenets of uh, creator creator design that you should know number one waste equals food um, and basically that's the you know the idea of zero waste right so waste really doesn't exist in nature and that we should be able to use all 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 things in continuous cycles so whatever something's made of <clears throat> we should be able to pull it apart and reintegrate it back into the system. And if you think about how long it takes, just to give you an example of um, not <laughs> sustainable resource use, if you think about the biodegradation rate of different things, um, you know, plastic, hundreds of years, um, and that's under the, these are optimal conditions, like disposable diapers, 500 years. Glass may never break down. Um, and these are under really ideal conditions, like sitting out in the sun, getting wet. Whereas if you if you bury a diaper, for example, or a plastic bottle in a landfill, there's very little oxygen, very little to biodegrade that. I mean, that can last for longer than that. Okay, so that's that's not sustainable. We we need to just imagine, you know, these landfills just filling up, and you know they're going to be there for hundreds, if not thousands, of years unless we figure out something to do with them. So we need to get away from that. So waste equals food is number one. <clears throat> number two is use current solar income. So that's just use 100% renewable energy. Um, in the U.S., uh, this is in like 2017. I thought that was a nice graphic. Um, about 10.6% uh, 
um, is um, like renewable generation, and then we have about 7% biomass. So about, we'll call it 17% of all the energy we use in the United States is renewable. That's, that's not sustainable, okay? So we, again, the push with cradle to cradle is to get rid of the idea of waste and, and all, all of this, this whole process, the, the mining, the, the manufacturing, the shipping, everything, um, needs to be um, run with renewable energy. And then the third tenet is celebrate diversity. <clears throat> okay, so this, we'll talk about biodiversity at a later point, but sort of understanding that um, diversity is strength, diversity is res resiliency. Just think about um, a, a forest, and if the entire forest was just the same species of tree, like, you know, for miles and miles and miles, and that's it, nothing else, no diversity. What if there's a, um, you know, something, a bug or whatever that is really loves those trees and will just destroy them? Well, then you have no forest left, right? And this is happening out west. Um, but if you have a bunch of different tree species, it's much less likely that there's going to be one thing, one insect, one pest, whatever, that will destroy the whole thing. So that, that offers that sort of resilience. Um, and that's, that's an important part of uh, the strength of diversity. Um, but also just considering, you know, kind of a systems thinking approach, um, you know, we sort of fit the, the, um, the product to the local, you know, environment, the local landscape. Okay, so those are your three tenets of creative, creative design. Again, the biological cycle is something that we're very familiar with, and they extend that to the technical cycle as well. So everything should be able to pull it apart and be reused. So you can see this is kind of like, uh, okay, that's nice to sort of think that way. It makes sense. Um, we need to rethink the design. That's great. Um, but they actually have a certification <clears throat> label. Okay, so you can go you can go to a store and find creative to creative products. And you can actually go online and you can get find an inventory of these. So I just want to give you an overview of how they do this. You don't need to be an expert on creative to creative design. But basically the, what, what they do is they rate it on these five different categories. So health, uh, reutilization, uh, renewable energy, water stewardship, and fairness. So you can see these are very sustainable um, goals, right? So material health, that's that whole, like, everything should be non-toxic. Don't put carcinogens in rubber ducks, you know, as, as he went over in that presentation. Reutilization is like, are they using circular resource use? Are they using 100% renewable energy? Are they carbon neutral? Are they not uh, overusing water? <clears throat> and also there's an equity component here, so that's social fairness. So they Basically, so you take a product, you're like, hey, I want to get create a, create a certification. There's a whole process, and they evaluate these five categories. And then it's kind of like um, a lot of the other things we've talked about, like with LEED, for example. Um, you have multiple certification levels, basic, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum, right? So this is in order of increasing, um, you know, uh, meeting increasingly meeting the cradle to cradle goals. Okay, so you can, there's a link there, you can look at some of these products. But I just want to give you an example of one product. This is like totally nondescript. I think they sell us at Target. Um, so you, if you if you see a product and you want, to, you want to know if it's cradle to cradle, you look for a label like this. Okay, so it'll be stamped right on the product. Um, I'm a big fan of putting these labels on products like fair trade, cradle to cradle, um, you know, that, you know, the Marine Stewardship Council, Forest Stewardship Council, all those things, because it makes it a lot easier um, to determine so um, if a product is relatively sustainable. So anyway, if, if you see this label, see it cradle to cradle, you know that it's gone through this really robust certification process. Um, and this one is gold, and, and they really want to have the high standard, as high standards as possible. And so this product, you can see in these five categories, right, health, reutilization, carbon management, and so forth, um, they got platinum for one, and they got gold for the rest. So your certification is based on the, the lowest um, individual certification. So if they had all platinum and then uh, like these four were platinum and this was gold, they would get gold. Okay. Um, and so just to give you an idea, again, I'm not going to go over this in a whole lot of detail. You can, you can look this up. Um, but just to give you a, a sample of how they rate these. So they got platinum, for example, for material health because all process chemicals have been assessed and none have been assessed as X. So basically in this product, they've used zero chemicals that are considered banned by cradle to cradle. <clears throat> okay. And you can see there's like these different scores, um, including social fairness with social fairness. You need at least two of these silver aspects. Okay. 
Um, so this is it's really robust, um, and you can buy products like this. You can go online on the Creator to Creator website and find products. <clears throat> Another really good thing about the certification, if you notice this this one, um, it's a little outdated, but uh, this was they got the certification in 2015, and you notice it expires, right? So they get two years for their certification. Um, after that, <clears throat> they can't claim that it's a creator to creator product anymore. So you have to constantly get recertified. And the idea there, in addition to probably <laughs> making more money for the creator to creator uh, certifiers, um, I'm sure that was, uh, you know, n not a, um, I'm sure that was considered, let's put it that way. But the what this really does is it makes sure that they're adhering to the most recent updated standards, right? So if you if you can get a certification for 10 years, it's like, well, okay, my product's done and I don't have to innovate anymore. <clears throat> but if it, if it um, expires in two years, that, that forces you to really make sure that you're keeping up with the latest standards. So again, you can buy these products in a store. Um, you can find them pretty much all over the place. Okay, so that's your creator to creator certification. So the last concept we're going to go over here is the circular economy, which is it's it's sort of similar, um, but you'll see it's a little bit different. So I'll play this video from the uh, MacArthur Foundation. And continue to Oops, let me get back here. Let's go. Have been around for a few billion years, and will be around for many more. In the living world, there's no landfill. Instead, materials flow. One species waste is another's food, energy is provided by the sun, things grow, then die, and nutrients return to the soil safely. And it works. Yet as humans, we've adopted a linear approach. We take, we make, and we dispose. A new phone comes out, so we ditch the old one. Our washing machine packs up, so we buy another. Each time we do this, we're eating into a finite supply of resources and often producing toxic waste. It simply can't work long term. So what can? If we accept that the living world's cyclical model works, can we change our way of thinking so that we too operate a circular economy? Let's start with the biological cycle. How can our waste build capital rather than reduce it? By rethinking and redesigning products and components and the packaging they come in, we can create safe and compostable materials that help grow more stuff. As they say in the movies, no resources have been lost in the making of this material. So what about the washing machines, mobile phones, fridges? We know they don't biodegrade. Here, we're talking about another sort of rethink. A way to cycle valuable metals, polymers and alloys, so they maintain their quality and continue to be useful beyond the shelf life of individual products. What if the goods of today became the resources of tomorrow? It makes commercial sense. Instead of the throw away and replace culture we've become used to, we'd adopt a return and renew one where products and components are designed to be disassembled and regenerated. One solution may be to rethink the way we view ownership. What if we never actually owned our technologies? We simply licensed them from the manufacturers. Now, let's put these two cycles together. Imagine if we could design products to come back to their makers their technical materials being reused and their biological parts increasing agricultural value. And imagine that these products are made and transported using renewable energy. Here we have a model that builds prosperity long term. And the good news is, there are already companies out there who are beginning to adopt this way of working. But the circular economy isn't about one manufacturer changing one product. It's about all the interconnecting companies that form our infrastructure and economy coming together. It's about energy. It's about rethinking the operating system itself. We have a fantastic opportunity to open new perspectives and new horizons. Instead of remaining trapped in the frustrations of the present, with creativity and innovation, 
we really can rethink and redesign our future. <clears throat> okay. So, I just love the circular economy concept. <laughs> I really think it just makes sense, right? I mean, of course, we live on a finite planet. Like, we can't keep using non-renewable resources. You know, if you... Th if, there, if you throw something away, is there really such a thing as a way? You, 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 you put it somewhere else, right? So it doesn't go away, it just goes somewhere else. So we need to rethink that whole thing. You can see a lot of very similar concepts to the cradle to cradle, 100% renewable energy, circular resource flows. I'm doing them in like, you know, uh, ways that can be reintegrated back in the technical, new, you know, the technical cycle. So it's a very similar concept. Um, I think the one, the one thing that, you know, the, it's sort of, the one way it sort of differs um, is this idea that um, a big part of the circular economy concept is this one where you, you tend to get away from this ownership model. Um, and if you think about it, do you really want to, do you need to own a washing machine? Is there any benefit to actually owning a washing machine? Or do you really just need to wash your clothes? And, you know, in a convenient, in a convenient way. I mean, same thing goes for refrigeration. Like, do you really, does your refrigerator status symbol, like, do you need, you know, you know what, do you really need a refrigerator or do you just need to keep things cold? And probably the, the most prominent example of this, um, I mean, I remember a time when, before Uber, right before Lyft <clears throat> if you wanted to you know get that service it was a cab company so there were still taxi cabs but the if you think about it um, you know this uh, Uber and Lyft and so forth that's a circular economy concept because I mean really do we need a car per se I mean it sits in your driveway or in front of your house or in your garage 95% of the time do you really need that or do you just need to get from A to B and so rethinking the car ownership model, that's a kind of commonplace now. I mean, a lot of folks, especially in, in urban areas, um, they don't really need to own a car. So um, that's a circular economy concept. Okay. Um, and so this is something that is, it's happening. You know, as I say in the video, this is happening. So it's not a totally ridiculous idea that someday we don't really own washing machines, we don't own microwaves, we don't own ovens, whatever, um, because we really don't need to. Um, but you have to, in order for that to really work, you have to um, adhere to the 100% renewable energy and make sure everything is um, used in closed uh, resource loops. Okay. Um, that's it for this discussion, uh, and I, I do hope that, you know, you walk away with this, if nothing else, you walk away from this thinking, number one, we need to use circular resource flow, have to. Number two, we have to drive our system with 100% renewable energy. And number three, um, we need to make products that are safe and can be safely reintegrated back into whatever system it is, whether it's organic material back into this, you know, the soil, the natural system, or these technical nutrients back into the technical system. But we really need to rethink how we design our products. Um, and in some ways, how we treat, you know, as consumers treat those products, how we think about those products. And maybe we need to rethink this whole like ownership mentality. Um, but the system has to change at sort of both ends. Um, okay, so that's it for this discussion.